welcome to the Animal Training Academy Making Ripples podcast show, the show where we share the stories of the ripple making extraordinaires with behavior nerd superpowers who make up the Animal Training Academy membership. I'm your host and one of the happiness engineers at Animal Training Academy, Shelley Wood from Drop Your Jaws Dog Training in Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the United States. We're absolutely thrilled and grateful to have you here with us today. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you don't miss a single episode. This show is brought to you on behalf of the Animal Training Academy membership. So if you like the conversations in these episodes, then we want to invite you to continue them with like-minded people in the ATA membership, which you can find out more about at www.atamember.com. Within the membership, you can get access to twice monthly live web classes, the back catalog of previous web class replays, plus a huge library of videos and projects to help you problem solve your training challenges. And we're a sociable bunch with an exclusive private Facebook group and forums area. It's like a Netflix social media platform for animal behavior geeks. Today, we are excited to welcome Zara Jackson to the show. Zara Jackson is a certified training partner with the Karen Pryor Academy, KPA CTP, and is a listed animal training instructor with the Animal Behavior and Training Council, ABTC. Zara has gained a FDSC in wildlife conservation with animal behavior and behavioral ecology modules and has an advanced diploma in animal behavior. Zara is also an approved trainer for taking the grr out of grooming dogs. Welcome, Zara. I'm super excited to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. Could you start us out today by telling us a little bit about your story and how you started working with animals and how you spend your days with them now? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, my, my career really started in 2008. Um, So I had applied to go to university to study a bachelor's degree in animal behaviour. And I thought it would look really good on my uni application if I had a bit of work experience. So I applied to the local zoo to do some voluntary work. Um, And luckily for me, because I was interested in animal behaviour, I was placed on the sea lion section. So I was very fortunate to work with Nikki Morrison, who's been on the main show. Uh, So she was my first mentor and continues to be a mentor actually to this day and a good friend uh, and I learned I learned how to how to work with sea lions and how to train animals um, and work around animals from these amazing sea lions and from Nikki so I was very very lucky there uh, so in about 2013 so I did get a paid job shortly after that and then around 2013 I sort of moved away from the sea lion section to set up some animal training programs for different animals around the zoo. So I would go past other animal enclosures on my way to work in the morning and chatting to the other keepers and things, it became quite apparent really that not all the animals were as easy to manage as our sea lions that were quite well trained. Uh, So that got me thinking that actually some of the other species on the park could uh, benefit from animal training programs and cooperative care. Um, In 2015, however, I met my current dog, Bob. Uh, So I I adopted my German Shepherd dog and he had lots of behavioural issues. So uh, the main one being reactivity towards other dogs. Um, And he hated anything to do with grooming. So claws, brushing, anything. He hated that kind of handling. Um, so clearly being an animal trainer, I set set to work on uh, helping Bob through some of those issues and helping him feel better about grooming and helping him to be calmer around other dogs and more manageable too. Um, so yeah, and shortly, uh, shortly later, I uh, started my dog training business. So I decided that it was really, I wanted to help other people with their dogs. You're with your dogs all day long and, and it can be really tricky to live with a dog with uh, behavioral issues. So um, I set about becoming certified as a dog trainer and my business was born. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, what an interesting background. I'm very jealous of the sea lion work that you did initially. I love little sea lions. I guess they're not so little, really. Um, so you 
started as a, a volunteer. That's a really great way, I think, to enter the probably the zoo world as well as any kind of work with animals. Um, and it sounds like you were lucky to get a lot of experience there with uh, Nikki. And then in your in your paid position, exactly what were you doing with all of the different animals and what kind of species did you work with? Yeah, so it was mainly the sea lions and penguins were on our section. Um, and when I moved away from the sea lion section, I worked with African lions, coatis, porcupines, some domestic species um, and some birds as well and some birds of prey. So a real, real variety of different different animals, which I was really lucky to have gained that experience and worked with some awesome people as well. And were you doing, was the training that you were doing uh, primarily for like, educational shows or cooperative care or just kind of a mix of everything or yeah so we did do a sea lion display uh so they were trained for show show behaviors they were also trained for some really cool husbandry behaviors as well so your basics moving between enclosures was dead easy with the sea lions they were really well trained um eye drops checking their mouths checking their flippers temperature x-rays all sorts of things that made it managing them just so much easier and less stressful for them as well. And were you able to use some of the training that you did for cooperative care also in some of the educational shows then as well? Yeah, yeah. We we like to put uh, the cooperative care element into our shows. So we would show the public how we managed the animals and how we looked after them. We'd demonstrate some of those behaviours that we used. So we like to say to people, it was an educational display, and we like to say, you know, animal training for tricks and things is cool and it's good fun for them. However, this is the real reason why we do it. It makes it a lot, lot less stressful for those animals as well. And it's, it's a lot safer for us to work around them too. That's great. And it seems like that could be a good way to to encourage people to think about those things with the own their own animals who they live with at home. Absolutely. Too. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, good. And and hopefully we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about a little more about Bob in a little bit here and some of the challenges maybe that you had with him. But before I ask about that, I want to ask a couple more questions about your work in the in the yeah, zoo world. Um, what were some of your favorite animals to work with when you were in the zoo, do you think? So, yeah, I mean, the sea lions were fantastic. They are great fun to work with, great fun to be around. Um, they really, really enjoy the the training as well. So they're always dead keen learners. Um, yeah, great fun to work with sea lions. I also got to work with things like the coatis. They're quite fun. Different challenges involved with different animals that can go up and down and be at different levels to you. <laughs> what were they, did you say? Uh, coati. So they're related to raccoons. But they're a little bit more slender. They've got these long ring tails, these little wriggly noses, um, very mischievous little creatures. Very mischievous. They sound like a lot of fun to work with. I love raccoons. So um, they sound super cute. Can you say it again for me? Kowalti. Kowalti? Kowalti. 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 I'll have to look them up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what were, did you find that any particular species that you worked with in the zoo was uh, more challenging to work with than others? Yeah, so the sea lions, by the time I started working with them, they were already very comfortable with people being around them. Uh, they were more than happy to take a fish off of you. Um, so they were very comfortable around people. When I started to move away from the sea lions, I realized that not all the animals felt that way about the keepers. So when you're doing animal training, as most trainers will know, you do develop a strong relationship with your animals because they're getting a high rate of reinforcement from you. You're getting a high rate of reinforcement from them. But some animals don't feel that way. And uh, so our crested porcupines were one of those animal species that did not like people being around them at all, which does make it quite tricky to manage them. So do you think that the challenge with the crested porcupines was because of their, who they are as crested porcupines or because of that reinforcement history that maybe they didn't quite have as much of that the sea lions did have a whole lot of or maybe some combination of both of those things? Yeah, so they can be quite flighty animals. I, I've met other ones that are absolutely that come up for a scratch and are quite happy to be around people. Um and obviously different 
species of animals, some, some of your prey type animals, so hoof stock might be a bit more flighty and more tricky to work with in that sense, that you've got to build a relationship and a trust with them before you can start working on cooperative care things. Um, but yeah, each individual within a species can feel differently towards other people as well. So uh, one of our porcupines did progress a lot quicker than the other. Um, we had a pair of uh, African male lions, a bachelor group there. One of them was more than happy to come up and be hand fed. The other one did not want to come anywhere near you. So, yeah, it's not just species difference, the individuals within those species. I guess it's the same for our dog breeds, isn't it? So, yeah, individual Labradors and Labradors versus Chihuahuas. Yeah, there's going to be differences between breeds and species. Yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense, of course. Um, so just real quick, and then I want to ask you some questions about Bob, but real quick, one more question about your experience in zoos. Um for people who are interested in getting into that field, do you have suggestions for them? Yeah, so when I was uh, younger, there wasn't any, there weren't the courses that there are these days. You know, there's lots of colleges I know in the UK that do offer, you know, that have actually exotic animal sections on their site. So they have like a, a mini zoo almost. Um uh, Yeah, a collection of animals that they used to teach people how to care for them and animal welfare. Uh, and we didn't really have a lot of these courses when I was younger. So the typical way in was to through voluntary work uh, or work experience. And I was lucky enough to get a place uh, to volunteer. You can do internships as well. So many zoos and if you're interested in sea lions, particularly a lot of sea lion facilities will do an internship. So that's another way in. Um, but yeah, lots of different routes now. There's lots of much many, sorry, much more options for people these days, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And maybe uh, using a combination of those options could maybe be a good mm. idea as well. So, yeah, well, thank yeah, you. for definitely. Thank you for sharing all of that so far. Um, I would like to ask you a couple of questions about Bob now. Uh, how, how old is Bob now? So Bob is, oh, I think he's going to be around 10 or over. So he was an adolescent when I adopted him. And this was eight years ago now. And you adopted him and realized right away that he had some challenges that you needed to work I, on with I him. was warned. I was, I, yeah, it was disclosed to me that he could be reactive to other dogs. Um, and maybe I was a little bit arrogant back then. I thought, yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a professional animal trainer. That's no problem for me. <laughs> um, but lo and behold, it was a little bit more tricky than that. And I did an awful, awful lot of learning from Bob especially in those early, early years. Yeah. And he already, when you adopt him, adopted him as an adolescent, he already had some um, negative feelings about grooming, it sounds like, too. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's my, what I learned was he was in a, so he's from abroad as well. So he came from Cyprus to the UK and he was fostered here. Um, and then I adopted him from the foster carer or through the foster program. So Bob, when he was picked up off the streets, he was a street dog. He had mange, so he would have received a lot of veterinary care treatments, washes, um, possibly creams and sprays, uh, which I imagine was quite painful on his sore skin. So he would have had a learning history about grooming related things, not being a nice experience or being painful. Um, so, yeah, that's my understanding of how where that's come about. Although it's not uncommon for animals to not feel OK about that, regardless of learning history. So, yeah. It was a that was a bit of a a challenge we had to deal with. Um, many dog owners, and I could get away with holding Bob and just doing it. Um, he's not a, he won't bite me. You can you can see that he's unhappy, but you could get away with it. Um, but I had previously worked with these large, dangerous animals that you absolutely would not get away with it. Um, so I, so I knew I had the skills to be able to teach him to feel more comfortable and give him a way of saying no as well. And so did you start working on those grooming challenges, I assume, right away with him, with your background? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. One of the first things we did was, um, so even just trying to take him anywhere near the bathroom, he knew. <laughs> he knew and he would, it was escape avoidance behaviours, you know, you'd label there. And he's trying to run away from you or hide. So I started by just putting enrichment and food in the bathroom. And then when I left the house. So I'm not even there. So he's just trying to get the room to be, you know, leaving it upstairs. So he's finding tasty, good, fun things in there. 
instead of just associating it with the taps going on, you're getting washed. <laughs> I love that. Um, for the reason that you're describing, because it, you're not even there and um, he can build a positive association with the room. Um, but the other thing that I really love about it is for somebody like me, um, I tend to want to start things like, oh, I'm just going to build a positive association with this thing. But I have a um, a tendency to want to push a little bit sometimes. Like, yeah. <laughs> So I think that's a great antecedent arrangement to make sure that the person isn't trying to um, coerce or cajole or do anything to get the dog to go into the space, but truly just leaving it up to them. So that seems like a really smart, smart thing to do there. Yeah. When I first put myself into the picture with the bathroom, I didn't go anywhere near the bath. It was just, we'd do some targets or we'd do some sits and, you know, behaviors he enjoyed doing. But we do it in and around the bathroom. So it wasn't always about, right, come on, in you get. <laughs> so he was learning to build a positive association with me being in the bathroom with him. Um, we just took it really slowly. How long did it take before you were in the bathroom with him? So it would have been a couple of weeks that I was doing the enrichment before I left the house. So I, I did that for a couple of weeks. Not every single day, but just on some, t- some days, there would just be something cool and fun to find in the bathroom. Um, and then then I tried co- recalling him up the stairs and that was it. Then send him back downstairs and then it would be, OK, recall him up to the bathroom and then do some fun stuff and then go downstairs with him. So we just sort of mixed it up uh, and then I sort of progressed it onto uh, we'd put a, like a, a non-slip mat into the bath. So we're reducing that slippy slidiness to make him more comfortable with it. Now, Bob was a lot younger then, so it was easier for him to jump in and out of the bath. So this is a this is a current problem I have is he's now a bit older, a bit creaky, um, and he's not wanting to jump into the bath like he used to. So I need to come up with some kind of, you know, way for him to get in safely and comfortably. So using some steps or something. But but yeah, we just played the game of in the bath, out the bath. Uh, so it's just jumping in, jumping out. So just asking him to jump in and out. And then we build up to having taps on. We build up to his feet. You know, it was, it was a long time before I actually bathed him. And shampooed him, yeah. Well, awesome. Um, It's great to hear a little bit about the way that you all worked through that. And it's also um, interesting to hear about the challenges that you're kind of having now with the bath as he ages. Um, Yeah. And that's the way that it is, I think, with all behavior situations change over time. And so we have to be flexible and creative moving forward. I'll be interested to keep up with how you work with him to address the new challenges. Um, yeah. At what point, what made you decide to leave the zoo world and start a dog training business? Yes. So uh, I, I also have two children as well. <laughs> so um, I, I got Bob and I started working through some of his, some of his issues. And I became very aware of how other people were also struggling with things like reactivity. And I suddenly I seen it everywhere. I went. Um, I struggled with it. So my I, gosh, I researched ev- all the books on dog to dog reactivity. I watched webinars. I researched and I tried all different you know protocols that are out there. And I would get so far with it, and then just hit a. I can get this close, but if I go any closer than that, that's it. He's in a frenzy again. So. Um, I found it really challenging. And when I was looking for trainers in the area that might specialize in that, there weren't any. So that's kind of what made me feel passionate about helping dog owners specifically. If we were having a problem with uh, any of the animals in the zoo, we can go home. We'll try again tomorrow. If you're having a problem with your dog, you're with that dog all the time. And it's it's particularly hard, I think, because you live with them. They are part of your family. Um, and a lot of the time, dog owners don't really get that little break either. Uh, so it can be really difficult for people to to manage and live with. So I felt really passionate about helping other people. Um, and I've always grown up with dogs, always loved dogs. So, yeah, that was, that was what made me want to take the step from zoo animals into, into pet dogs. Yeah. That's great. And I would guess that you might sometimes miss the zoo training world a little bit. Is that, would I be Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I think I know a few people that have gone uh, from sea lions into dog training, actually. We all miss sea lions. We all miss the zoo world. 
Um, but we love the dog world as well. And we love, we love dog training. Yeah. So. I, I could see that you would miss it. And it's wonderful that you love dog training and love the dog world as well. And I think it's really great for the people to, you know, um, to have somebody with your background and experience available to help them with their dogs. I think you're a major asset to the dog training community. So oh, thank you very much. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's great that you um as long as you're still great with it and happy with it, I think it, it, it's a wonderful spot for you to be right now, for sure. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I find it very reinforcing to help people and see them progress and, and coaching people as well. So yes, yeah, it's, it's really enjoyable. And I think that something that you said really resonated with me about... Um, it's 24 hours a day with our companion animals. You know, it's really um, relatively... It's not, it's relatively straightforward to create a training plan for certain behaviors, especially if you're able to pick that plan up and put it down as you um, mm -hmm. are able to. But when you're living with another being 24 hours a day, um, problems pop up and they, they come and go and it becomes very challenging. So definitely resonated yeah, with that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, uh, with the zoo animals, you know, you can control a lot more of the antecedents you have a lot more control over, you know, the environment that you're training in. Um, but with dogs, you know, if you're training a dog and you're on a walk, I can't, I can't guarantee that we're not going to get a dog running up to us off lead. There's so many bits I cannot control. Um, and that does make dog training particularly tricky sometimes, I think. Yeah, absolutely. You can't control the dogs running up off lead. If you're on a walk, you can't control how many dogs you're going to see or exactly where they're going to pop up. All of that. For yeah. Sure. So exactly. I'd like to talk a little bit now, uh, and I think it's just going to kind of keep us for a little while right now on the same road that we're kind of on. Um, but I'd like to talk a little bit now about a recent training related challenge that you've experienced, uh, how you worked through it and some things that you've learned from it. Yeah, sure. So um, it's an ongoing really with Bob's reactivity towards other dogs. And we've made so much progress. Initially, I started off with, so I'm marine mammal trainer. I like, I like a marker. <laughs> so I bought myself some clickers and a treat pouch. Um, and that was that was what I felt comfortable doing and, you know, running with, with the reactivity. I was like, I can work for this too. Um, so I started off with like an engage, disengage protocol where you would click them for looking at the dog and then eventually you'd hold off on that click and then they would look to you and go, hey, where's my click? You click them for disengaging. So, and that worked really well up until a point. Um, so I did see a reduction in the barking and the lunging. Uh, however if we there was still like a threshold where you'd get so close and then no it wasn't going to work but it was quite sort of frantically look at the dog look at me look at the dog look at me it wasn't a calm dog necessarily it was just still a quite a frantic dog but without the barking and lunging and the big display you know uh, so uh, I started to think about so it was actually I was watching a Shrag Patel one of Shrag's uh, webinars um, and something he said was, well, what does a calm social dog look like? And how do we shape those behaviors? And I was like, yeah, okay. So dogs, as they approach each other, they're A, not going to come head to head, nose to nose, directly at each other. This is how Bob would behave. Um, well, I want to see him with his sniffing the floor, shaking off, not staring at the other dog, looking away, moving in like a circular sort of banana shape towards the other dogs. Um, so I really started to think about what I did want to see rather than what I didn't want to see from Bob. So, so yeah, I want to, I want to see that head down sniffing. How do I get that? So it was, how do you deliver the treats? Where do you deliver the treats? Um, at the same time, you're managing your thresholds. It, yeah, it was quite, it was very tricky, but that's a big takeaway I took from Bob, um, was, you know, what do I want to see instead Looking back to me is okay, but it's still quite frantic. Um, but the the nose down sniffing, that's going to signal to the other dogs, hey, I'm chill, I'm calm, I'm no threat. And and it helps to relax its neck muscles and sniffing, going up sniffing is always good. So, so yeah, this really helped us to to break through with the dog-to-dog -dog reactivity after years of trying different, different protocols. 
And actually now I use Bob as a stooge dog for my clients' reactive dogs, which I never thought in a million years I would have had that dog in front of clients' dogs, um, teaching them how to calm down. So I am really, really proud of how how far Bob's come. Um, yeah, really, really proud of him. Could you share a little bit about how you um, facilitated getting those behaviors that you wanted to see, like nose down, sniffing, curved body? Yes. So uh, nose down, if you feed, you can feed on the floor, but then the head comes straight back up again looking for the next treat. So I would put maybe three treats on the floor and then the next treat would come before the head even come back up. So initially it was like just raining treats on the floor for, you know, and I'd sometimes I'd pause and let him look at the other dog. Um, and because he'd been sniffing for a while, he was much more able to think rather than just go straight into barking and woofing at it. So, yeah, it was it was shaping duration of nose down in the same way you shape duration on any other behavior. And then you sort of do your easy hard reps. So you'd hold off for a couple of seconds, more treats on the floor, hold off for five seconds, treats on the floor. So, yeah, seesawing up. So you're getting much more of this duration sniffing behavior. Um, so, yeah, it's just building duration on the sniffing. Um, also watching his fur patterns on his back so the heckles can go up when he gets over aroused and frustrated watching for that curved body language and stuff so I'm not just saying if you see dogs you put nose down or you see dogs you look at me I'm giving him different options these are all things that will access reinforcement um, so as well as that Bob actually a lot of the time I found would want to access the other dogs so it wasn't a distance increasing behavior so we would move slowly by sniffing but if he went stiff, then I would pause. I'd put the brakes on a little bit there and wait for him to go loose again. And then we might start moving forward and shaping more sniffing. So it's it was a big learning curve. Lots to think about. And do you think one thing that kind of stands out to me is that um, not only might these strategies impact Bob's behavior, but do you think there's potential that using these strategies might impact the behavior of other dogs who you might encounter as well? Yeah, so they do have these sort of calming signals. And it's I, I explain it like the way I might just scroll on my phone when I'm awkwardly stood at a train station as a stranger over there. So like it's that avoiding eye contact thing. Um, so reducing social pressure and they will look away from each other, sniff on the floor, that shake off. It all signals, hey, I'm no threat. Nothing going on here. I'm no, but Bob, without my intervention, he would go straight up to other dogs, get right in their face. He might be barking. He was rude. He was really rude. And that would set off the other dogs uh, potentially barking uh, to get him to go away. So, yeah, it's it was shaping that much calmer behavior in him and allowing him, A, the reinforcers from the food, but also access as a reinforcer. And so it sounds like you've come, it sounds like you said you still struggle a little bit sometimes with Bob, but you've come a really long way in that he's even able to be a helper dog for you these days. Yeah, I mean, I, I still would consider him a managed dog. Uh, I live in a seaside town and the, the seafront area of our town gets very busy with dogs. Every other person has a dog. He's, Bob is never going to be the dog I take down the seafront in the height of summer. And I'm okay with that. That's fine. He's not going to enjoy it. He's going to be frustrated the entire time. Um, I'm probably going to be quite stressed out as well. And when I'm stressed out, I don't always make my best decisions either. So, yeah, it's, it's he's still quite managed, but he's done exceptionally well. And, you know, he's other dogs now. And as long as they haven't just suddenly appeared around a the corner, then, yeah, we can manage it. And he sees the other dogs and he starts sniffing the ground. And with your uh, dog training clients, do you, do I understand correctly that you specialize in working with reactivity for them? Yes, I do. Yeah. So um, there's obviously lots of different factors that can factor into reactivity. It can be lots of different functions to that kind of behavior. Um, so barking and lunging at other dogs. So yeah, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about reactivity it is a label. Um, so yeah, barking and lunging at other dogs, pulling towards them. Uh, scratching the floor, howling, growling sometimes. It can all be sort of lumped under that reactivity label. But yeah, I that can be because the dog's potentially fearful. We can, we can think of all these different reasons as to why they're behaving or what the function is. But ultimately, I think 
um, we have to look at, well, what do we want? What does a calm dog look like and how can we help this dog to feel calm? Um, we have to rule out medical issues as well. So quite frequently, I do send people back to their vets. Um, I'm seeing more and more uh, gait issues in dogs. And I've had I've sent them back to their vets because I, I don't specialise in, in gait analysis or anything like that. So, yeah, it's definitely one of those things that can typically um, involve other health things that need to be looked at as well as just the behaviour modification side of it. Thank you for that. Thank you for both unpacking um, what we what we mean, what you mean when you say reactivity, and also um, for mentioning that when we're working on behavior is like reactivity or really any behavior challenge. It's a great idea uh, to pull in other people to the team, including medical folks. Sometimes, so thanks for mentioning. Absolutely, those things. yeah, yeah. And I imagine you uh, use different strategies with different dogs, depending on what you think the function of their reactivity might be. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think sometimes it's hard to uncover the function. I have had a couple of dogs where I, I just can't quite put my finger on whether it is that they want space from that other dog or whether they are wanting is frustration and they want to get closer to the other dog. Either way, the behaviors they're displaying are ones that we don't want to see <laughs> that make it difficult for us to hold on to them and we can get the judgmental looks off other dog walkers so um so yeah so if i'm if i have in mind if it is certain that not certain if i have sort of more evidence that it's frustration they want to get closer then sometimes i will allow them to get closer as a reinforcer um if i a lot of time you can tell when it's that they want distance so they're fearful they want that other dog to get out of their way and that that current reactivity barking lunging is being maintained by distance uh, by negative reinforcement essentially so you can have that in mind and be using that as well so when I work with clients and setups I will control the distance for them so they're not having to walk around with their dog too much but again it's so dog dependent because some dogs are okay with standing still other dogs would prefer to be on the move so you have to work with the dog that's in front of you and you have to watch the dog's body language um, you have to manage your stooge dog as well and make sure they're happy and comfortable. Um, but yeah, your your client's dog, you need to be watching all the time and you have to be sort of taking that data in your head. Am I seeing less of this and more of that? Am I seeing more of the sniffing and the calm or is it getting more worked up? So you have to be just constantly assessing it as you go. Yeah, and that's a great reminder too. Thank you for talking about the importance of taking that data and constantly assessing things as we go and not getting stuck necessarily in just like this is the protocol we're using and we're moving straight forward with this, um, but yeah. being <laughs> willing to be flexible and, and modify as the data tells you to. So that's great. Yeah. Are there any other... Um, challenges that you can think of? I know we talked a little bit about cooperative care earlier, but I'm wondering if you have any other challenges that you can think of related to that that you might want to talk a little bit about. So uh, yeah, a recent behavior I, I taught Bob to help with his cooperative care is a mouth open behavior. And I have taught this to sea lions and to African lions and birds. And I found it particularly challenging with my German shepherd. I He's not the kind of dog that picks up or bites things. Um, if you present him with something, he's not going to take it, you know, like a spaniel or a retriever might. So I, I really struggled with how to teach him. So initially I started my training plan with um, using a chin rest as the chin target and maybe targeting the muzzle up. So this worked with sea lions where you target the bottom of the mouth and the top of the mouth and you, you gradually move those targets far, further apart. Um, but it just didn't work with my dog. <laughs> so I had to come up with a new solution. Um, I couldn't get him to bite onto a thing. So I've seen it where people have built like a cage or something, or they give the dog something to hold in their mouth. Um, and that is almost your start button to continue with, with handling around the mouth area. And then you fade in your toothbrushes, dental scalers, torches and things. Um, but Bob didn't want to bite onto anything. So I started with a loo roll tube, like, will you bite this? <laughs> but he wasn't even willing to bite something small. And I, I tried with various different things, see if there's something he was more, he's not a fetcher, just wasn't working out for, for him. So I did train him. I put my, I did train him with targets, finger targets in the end. 
but I had to start with a capturing procedure. So I had to sort of hold my, train him to have my hands near to his mouth and he, he was comfortable with that. And I had to sort of capture the mouth opening slightly. And because my fingers smelt of treats, he might have thought I was about to give him a treat. And as soon as that mouth moved, I marked it. So I was using a clicker actually, um, and then followed through the treat. So I gradually shaped mouth open. And then it sort of progressed on to a targeting kind of uh, protocol. So his canine, his top canine would sort of sit on my index finger. And then the rest of his mouth would target onto my thumb. So I managed to shape an open mouth using my finger and my thumb, um, like I did with the sea lions and the lions, actually. But I had to shape it in a different way with with my German shepherd to what works with those guys. So, yeah, it was it was, it was a challenge. And I, I think I think I thought it might be easier with a dog, but it wasn't. Interesting. Um, and I don't, I've never trained an open mouth behavior. Um, I'm trying to think, and I don't think that I have. Uh, so I think you might've just inspired me to try to do that with my, with my dogs. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fun to train. It was, a, it was good to hit those problems and have to come up with different solutions to elicit the behavior you want to, you want to see and mark and reinforce. Yeah. Yeah. It does sound like it would be fun to train. And I think that was a, another good example of what you were just talking about when we were talking about reactivity, as far as taking data and um, modifying your plan based, you know, yeah. a, according to the data that you get yeah, and changing the strategy. Um, and I imagine so it sounds like a lot of fun to train. It also sounds like a behavior that would be really practical to have in your kit as well. So you can use an open mouth behavior for toothbrushing, you mentioned. Can you think of other things that you might want that for? Yeah, so I, I faded in like a little key ring torch that I had. So I can really look all around his mouth gums and down his throat even. So uh, that's that was um, one aspect to it. Again, I've been adding in some brushing. So his teeth are actually in really good nick for, for a dog of this age. But, you know, there is some plaque on the canine sometimes. So I have now faded in the um, tooth scaler as well, which I had to go very slowly with because it's, it's not nice. But, um, yeah, that's something we, we do every now and again. It's a bit, you know, with injection training where you'd only really bring one in. Um, not every single time you're doing the training for it. So we 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 play around with different objects, touching his teeth, including my fingers. Uh, so it's not always the big, scary metal dental scaler or a toothbrush. So, yeah, keeping him engaged in it and mixing up with some more fun behaviors as well. I found his key with with Bob. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing all of this so far. Could you share with us now about a training situation that you are proud of and or one that you have found reinforcing? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm going to go back and talk about the uh, African crested porcupines, actually. So I used to walk past their enclosure on my way down to sea lions and they had two sides to their inside. So it's like a, an inside area that was split in two and you could close them off individually. And the keepers were having to wait until the animals had moved overnight before they could clean clean one of the areas. And when you go in to clean that area, the animals are right there and they were getting quite stressed out by people being in close proximity. If people were in the enclosure to clean, so we'd have to kind of um, fill in any holes that they've dug overnight, change any enrichment, take out water bowls, refill water, you know, poo pick, all the usual husbandry things. But when people were going in there, they were getting really quite upset. So that looks like in porcupines, foot stamping, rattling their quills. Um, and eventually, if they feel really threatened, they will charge charge at you backwards uh, with those quills, which is quite a scary concept. So uh, in the interest of keeping keepers safe, but also keeping those animals were obviously quite stressed out to be stamping and quill shaking. And, um, and there was also a lot of stereotypic behavior from these guys. So it was kind of pacing. They were crammed up in the as far away as they could possibly get from humans and then they would sort of pace at the back and we've seen that this used to happen more frequently when the park was busy so when there was lots of people around um so we looked at helping them to feel a bit more safe and a bit calmer uh, around people because it's unavoidable um in in the zoo environment they you're going to have to have some interaction with keepers so uh that animal training program helps them to feel better it improves their welfare However, the the challenge I I was met with was on the sea lion section. You know, 
those sea lions were all more than happy to take a fish off you. You throw a fish at them, it's like, yes, you know, they were more than happy to take that. If you tried to roll a piece of food into one of these crested porcupines, you might as well have just thrown a grenade in there because they were terrified, you know, any movement really set them off. So food reinforcers weren't working. So what was a sea lion trainer to do with an animal that doesn't want to take a food reward? So I went to a animal training symposium at Chessington World Adventures in the UK. And this was with Sabrina Brando and Tim Sullivan. And we just got a chance to discuss some of our animal training things we were working through. And I, I spoke about my porcupines. We tried habituation where you put the bowl of food in, you stay outside the enclosure and will they take food with you around? And it just it wasn't working. Uh, and Sabrina actually said, well, you could try like a negative reinforcement contingency with this. And, you know, you're the aversive. So when you see karma behavior, leave. <laughs> so you remove yourself. Um, and as a sea lion trainer at the time, negative reinforcement kind of made me think of uh, traditional horse training where an aversive is applied to then be removed to reinforce behavior. Um, so it gave me ick feelings, but actually negative reinforcement contingency was going on all the time for these animals. And it was maintaining their current uh, foot stamping, quill shaking um, and stereotyping. So it was already at play and it was pretty much unavoidable. So, um, yeah, let's give, let's give it a go. So we started off uh, going into the enclosure. We'd stand by the gate as far away from the animals as you could possibly get. Uh, they were still obviously quite stressed. I was like, mm. I was, at, at first I was waiting for them to sort of look round at me, but it didn't happen. But what I did notice was you can see how quickly they're breathing because their quills move up and down as their breathing rate. And I waited for that quill, for those quills to slow down, so the breathing rate to decrease. And as soon as I seen that just start to slow, I got out. So, um, so yeah, that's that's how we got started with them. And it was actually after weeks of trying to with food, we got nowhere with this negative reinforcement strategy. You know, within within a week, they were starting to like look at us and be like, oh, what do you want? And then we got to the point quite quickly that we were able to switch to positive reinforcement and, and hand feed them. So I was really proud of this uh, particular training challenge because we were able to move the porcupines into a much better enclosure um, by targeting them into a crate. And we did crate training. So my colleague, um, Kelly, and I worked really hard on this and we targeted into a crate and then we'd lift the crate just slightly off the ground move it around the enclosure so we really built up um positive feelings around the crate and so one of the porcupines Sid was able to be moved from the top of the park down to the meerkat desert where they had heaps of space um with no stress and, and no aggressing towards keepers um, the, his female companion didn't quite get to the same level as him by the time it was move day so we did have to use a bit of coercion to get her into into a crate um, but she did recover, recover quickly from that. But yeah, it's, it's to see the difference between the two porcupines. So the one that had got really far with the training to just in your crate, in he goes, and then we carry him down as opposed to the female where we had to get a board behind her and kind of coerce her in. Um, so yeah, had we have had a bit more time perhaps or a bit more, more resources, we may have been able to get her to that point. But I think as a priority at that point, it was going to do more for her welfare to be in a quieter part of the park in a better enclosure. So, so that's where we went with her. But uh, yeah, we had had them both hand feeding from us, and we've seen ultimately we've seen less stereotypic behaviour and much calmer behaviour from them when keepers had to go in to do their husbandry uh, duties. That is amazing. And I would be super proud of that and find that super reinforcing if I were you as well. It seems yeah, that there's a big learning curve. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it seems that there's really a theme running through everything that you've talked about so far, as far as, you know, just really paying attention, collecting that data and being prepared to modify and change our plans if they're not working at the at, at that time. So I yeah, love that. Definitely. Yeah, I love that. And I, I love that you were, um, you know, I think that I have had the same kind of feelings that I think that you 
we're expressing about negative reinforcement. And I know that I think a lot of other people in the positive reinforcement kind of training community have maybe felt like that before too. Um, but it is, um, it's not just one thing, right? There's kind of a, I guess, a continuum of the application of negative reinforcement. And when you're in a situation where it's already happening like that, yeah. and you're just not getting anywhere, um, it makes sense to use it to your to your advantage so that you can then shift yeah. to using positive reinforcement. Yeah, and certainly with those guys, um, if I'd have carried on trying and trying and trying and getting nowhere with food, these animals would have carried on being and being and being stressed. So um, it, it helped us move quicker when you use the reinforcement contingency that's already maintaining the problematic behavior. Um, and I, I do see this, I do see this with dogs as well. Um, and with your training setups, you can set up negative reinforcement contingencies to be less worrying so by maintaining as much distance as you can or diluting the stimulus but but yeah if it's already there and it's you know it's it's never one contingency at play there's always always more than one thing going on there so it's knowing what's what's maintaining the current behavior and and trying to do it in the most in the least coercive way possible yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you for for sharing that. Uh, there are actually a couple really great posts in the Animal Training Academy Facebook community right now of folks that are kind of talking about similar things, uh, not with porcupines, um, <laughs> but with other animals and um, using uh, negative reinforcement when that when that aversive is already there and that contingency mm. is already at play you know so yeah during the COVID-19 lockdowns I went to help out in a dog grooming salon for uh we were doing welfare grooms you were allowed to open for these and I had a little shih tzu on the table and it had to get washed and dried and it hated the whole thing um, and this animal was actually wearing a cone to stop it from biting you and it was restrained and you know my cooperative care brain just going oh gosh this is awful you know it was it was just a really horrible experience. It was just get it done. Um, but using the dryer, I, I started, this dog was dancing around and moving its feet up and down. But I, I had just held the dryer pointing away from it. And then as soon as his feet went still, I turned it off. And then I put it back on again. And as soon as his feet went still, I turned it off. And I just gradually brought it closer. And actually, I think I, I was rewarding calmness with removing the dryer. Now, it, you know, I wouldn't want to go stick a, dry right in his face and only take it off once he calmed down that's a very coercive way of doing it. but by holding the dryer at a distance away from him and taking it off typically what happens is you're drying or brushing a dog and then they turn around and bite you and then your hand moves away so they're learning that that's the effective way to get the thing to stop um so yeah there are there are ways of using it in a less coercive less you know aversive way but it's 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 typically when something is already aversive and it's already operating under a negative reinforcement contingency anyway. Sometimes you can make more progress by reinforcing calm behavior with the maintaining negative reinforcer. Yeah, um, I'm glad that you brought that up about the dryer and the distance because that reminded me of something else that you were talking about when you were talking about the porcupine situation that I thought was um, really a great application of um, the, the technique you were using. And that was how the splitting that you were doing, talking about, you know, uh, looking for just the the slightest change in the breathing of the porcupine before you, you went away, you know, so you're not waiting for something major to happen, you know, just looking for that really, really small thing. And then not exactly the same thing, I guess, as I'm saying it now uh, <laughs> that you're talking about with the dryer, but, but talking about starting with that, um, stimulus uh, at as low of intensity as possible before um, seeking, you know, looking for that small behavior from the animal to tell you to, to take it away then. So very good. Yeah. Um, gosh, you said something else that I wanted to touch on there too, but now I can't, now I can't remember. <laughs> Which is unfortunate um, because it's super, super interesting. Um, oh, I know what it was. It was the um, the idea that sometimes um, it's going to be more effective and um, maybe not even just more effective, but uh, 
it's going to be a good choice, I guess, to use uh, negative reinforcement when that is the contingency that is already at play and you can't get into positive reinforcement. And I think that with those examples that you're using, you know, where the, the porcupine is like clearly views the humans as an aversive or the... Um, dog that clearly viewed the dryer as an aversive. For some animals, you can bring something else in, like food or uh, play or whatever. You can bring something else into the picture, and that may be a reinforcer for them, you know. But for some animals, it's like, no, the most reinforcing thing for me is for this thing to stop right now. Absolutely, and definitely. I said to people, you know, I, I used to, I'm much better now, but I used to be horrendous with dental treatment so I used to get sedated like have a sedative before going to the dentist um, now if you tried to get me to be good for the dentist and stay still and not cry and you tried to reward me with chocolate or something you know that one of those reinforcers I'm too stressed to eat I don't I don't want to eat that when I, my heart rate's through the roof my adrenaline's through the roof my cortisol's through the roof I don't want to eat uh, so sometimes it is your option and I'd rather seek to use that option in the in the least aversive way possible, in the least coercive way, than just let this animal continue worrying um, about about the scary thing. Yeah, and those um, those posts in the ATA community that I mentioned that are kind of on this topic right now, something that has really kind of popped into my head as I've read those things, as and as we're talking now, is that it's really can be, depending on the situation, a really respectful way to kind of quote unquote listen to another individual when they're when they're telling you, like in the dentist chair, no, no, chocolate. What what are you talking about? No. <laughs> <laughs> what I need is for this to stop, you know. So I think it can be a way to be really respectful and say, oh, oh, this I I hear what you're saying, you know. Yeah. In an ideal world, you would uh you would you know, with with Bob's eardrops and things, I was able to teach him the chin rest uh, to give consent. And then you fade in the drops, the ear fiddling and the cleaners and things. And you fade it in gradually with the sea lions and their eye drops. You, you bring in, you use a target and then you bring in the drops and you build it so gradually that they are comfortable at every single stage of training. However, real life doesn't always, you know, work that way when you have fearful animals. Yeah, for sure. Great. All great examples and all great stuff to think about. So thank you for sharing everything that you have shared with us today so far, Zara, or Zara, I'm sorry. Um, before we wrap up, I do want to give you a chance to um, mention if there is anything we've covered quite a bit of different stuff today. Um, but if there is anything that I failed to ask about, or if you have any last thoughts that are lingering in your head of anything that you want to share um, before we move on. I'm going to give you a chance to do that. Yeah, I, I guess my lingering thought would be it doesn't just work on animals. So <laughs> I've got two children I mentioned earlier as well. And um, one of my daughters, when she was very young, was uh, diagnosed with uh, conjunctivitis, which is inflammation infection in the eye. And we had to give her uh, eye drops. And my husband was holding her and I'm trying to get the eye drops into her. She's screaming. I was like, oh my God, I can't do this. This is horrendous. Um, and I trained sea lions for eye drops and we did, you know, regular eye washes and things with those guys. And it was all, uh, con you know, consensual. You ask them to target. And as long as they're staying on the target, they, you know, if they break from target, you stop. So um, I read about tag teach, which is essentially like using a, tagging people so using a clicker to mark uh, so for the children I gave them certain tag points and they would earn a click and then they would they would get their treat after getting so many clicks so um, some of those tag points that I used for those would be like chin up was was a tag point um, eye open uh, tag point dropper is going to be this far away from your eye or you know so you make it really simple and break it down and you gradually move that dropper nearer the eye um, using those tag points to communicate to the kids. Um, and I did manage to get cooperative eye jobs from, from two toddlers. So it doesn't just work on animals. It was a much more kind way to uh, medicate my children when they needed it too. 
Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, I'm thinking as you were talking, I'm not sure I, I it's possible that I'm, I'm wrong about this, but I think that you may have covered more species in this episode than anybody who I've had on this show yet. <laughs> <laughs> Variety is the spice of life. <laughs> uh, um, before we wrap up, could you tell everybody how they can get in touch with you, um, where they can find you if they want to learn more about what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm Zara and I my, my business, so I can be contacted through my Facebook page and that is Tarka Dog Training. Um, and yeah, so feel free to reach out through, through the business page. Um, or Tarka Dog Training at gmail.com. It'd be, be great to hear from people. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And we will link to that in the show notes as well. So folks can find you if they um, want to reach out and talk more. So Zara from myself, um, on behalf of everybody listening today, on behalf of the ATA community, thank you so much for taking the time to join me and share about your experience with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. We do, of course, appreciate all of you tuning in as well. And if you have enjoyed this episode and are interested in carrying on the conversation about working with the animals in our lives in the most positive, most fun, and most choice-rich ways, then as mentioned at the start of this episode, the Animal Training Academy community is waiting for you. Head on over to www.atamember.com and click on the membership button in the main menu to learn more about what members are describing as the Netflix social media platform for behavior geeks. That's it for this episode, though. Thank you so much for listening. You'll hear from us again soon.